this uh, Sunday service here at St John's. Uh, my name is Rick Bannister. I'm one of the clergy here. Please sit as we have just a few notices uh, before we get going. Is my mic off? Oh, okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. That works, doesn't it? Yes, that's much better. Good. You'd have thought by now I'd have worked this out. Anyway, um, notices. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you. As you can see, we're still in sort of sort of COVID land, so uh, you don't need to wear your mask for the whole of the service. We only ask that you wear it when you're singing, because that's the really high risk bit. Um, but also when you come up for communion as well, please don't sort of, um, as, we're, as we're distributing the elements, we'll try and keep them sort of unbreathed on, as it were. Uh, coming up uh, soon is Alan Fidiment's farewell. So he will be here this time next week. So if you want to say farewell to Adam, Alan Fidiment in person, he'll be here joining us uh, for Sunday worship. And as you'll see in the notice sheets, uh, if you want to contribute to a gift to him, say thank you for all the ways he's helped serve at St John's, then uh, there's a deadline for that, which is this Tuesday. Um, also coming up next Sunday at 3pm uh, is the chapter, deanery chapter service, uh, the, the deanery service, which is at St Mary's Pinchbeck. So if, if you'd like to go to that, you're welcome to. Um, if that's not your thing, you might prefer the um, Saturday evening, 730 uh, evening of praise and worship with Dave Mailer, which would be really excellent, and that will be held here. Is that all the notices? Have I got them all? What do you think? Yep, okay, terrific. In that case, let's pray for our service and then we'll sing our first hymn. Heavenly Father God, we have come here to draw near to you. Uh, we pray that you would draw near to us. Please, would you feed our souls through word and song and sacraments hear our prayers and make us more like your son jesus christ for his glory amen please stand as we sing our first hymn angel voices ever sing
let us worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please sit. As we come to our God, uh, we confess our wrongdoing against him, knowing that he is a merciful God who loves to forgive us and even sent Christ to die to forgive us. So we pray with confidence. O oh God, our loving Father, we know that you forgive us when we turn to you. We ask you to forgive us for the wrong things we have done and the good things we have not done. We have forgotten to love you, and we have forgotten to love one another. We are truly sorry. We turn again to you. Please help us to lead better lives every day. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So may the Father of all mercies wash away your sins and mine, and set us all on fire with his Spirit, through his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray our colleagues together. Almighty God, you search us and know us. May we rely on you in strength and rest on you in weakness, now and in all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The reading is taken from Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 6 to 13. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes of Babylon, I went to the king. After some time, I asked leave of the king and returned to Jerusalem. I then discovered the wrong that Eliashib had done on behalf of Tobiah, preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the room. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back the vessels of the house of God, with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who had conducted the service had gone back to their fields. So I remonstrated with the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? But I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses the priest Shalemiah, the scribe Zadok, and Hadiah of the Levites, and as their assistant, Haman, son of Zachar, son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful, and their duty was to distribute their associates. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys, and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them at that time against selling food. Tyrians also, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I remonstrated with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing that you're doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your ancestors act in this way? And didn't our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet we bring more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. When it began to be dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I set some of my servants over the gates prevent any burden from being brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of merchandise spent the night outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, Why do you spend the night in front of the wall? 
If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favour, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke the language of various peoples. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and beat some of them, and pulled out their hair. And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons, or for yourselves. Did not King Solomon and Israel sin on account of such women? Among the many nations there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, son of the high priest of Aishu, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. I chased him away from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood, the covenant of the priests and the Levites. Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times, and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. This is the word of the Lord. Father, you speak to us uh, words uh, relevant to our lives and words we need to hear, even if they come in an ancient we pray that you'd open our eyes and ears now to hear you speaking to us as we look at that passage again. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we said, I don't quite know what we get uh, when we, that's great, these slides are here, fantastic. Um, but I didn't know what we make of Nehemiah. I wasn't quite sure what we'd find when we started it. I'd like to spend the first two thirds of the sermon looking at the first 12 chapters, but pulling out the practical lessons from there. Um, before then spending that last chunk of the sermon looking at chapter 13. Um, if you haven't been here for a while, you, know, you, you, you may not know that the book is autobiographical. It's Nehemiah, um, who starts out as an exile. He's far from home. Uh, he's the cupbearer of the king in the Persian court. Um, and he finds out that his homeland and his home city in Jerusalem lies in ruins. Uh, it's a disgrace uh, on the public political sphere. It's a disgrace to God then because it's the city of God that's in the ruins. Nehemiah is deeply moved and praise and praise and praise, uh, and he ends up back in Judah as governor uh, of the province and governor of the city, and he then tells the story of how he restores Jerusalem. And it's quite a simple story, really, because chapter one, uh, Jerusalem's in trouble, it's got two problems, it's defenseless and it's empty. Um, chapter two to six, they fix the defenselessness. They rebuild the walls. Uh, chapter 7 to 11, Nehemiah leads the operation to repopulate the city, so then it's no longer empty. And in chapter 12, we can have a massive party, uh, and there's a big celebration and a service of worship, as the whole city is then rededicated to God. As we zoom in a bit more to the next slide, please, um, then we can see that there's, there's various things. One is the importance of prayer. So Nehemiah prayed and prayed and prayed, and he got the king of Persia, to do a complete U-turn on his own deliberate foreign policy. Jerusalem was in ruins because the king of Persia wanted it to be like that. Somehow, well, what God uh, means that he changes his mind and sends Nehemiah with a commission to rebuild it. Now, why did God hear and answer that prayer? Did he aid Nehemiah one? Well, not in the least. In chapters one and five and nine and 13, uh, Nehemiah is quite honest. He's not perfect. He's a sinful human being like the rest of us. But prayer, by imperfect, sinful, sinful human beings, people who get to make mistakes and do things wrong, can still change things because God 
is a God of grace and mercy, and he answers his people's prayer. I don't know, maybe there's a prayer that you have not dared to pray, because you think, well, it's too big a prayer for a little person like you. Why would God want to hear me pray this prayer? And we give up. We think we're not important enough or good enough for God to hear this prayer for us, or to hear our prayers at all. Well, that can't be the case, because if only perfect people have their prayers heard, then no one can have their prayers heard, including Nehemiah. But Nehemiah prayed and got results, not because he was some spiritual superman, but because he's a normal human being, trusting in a very good and merciful and gracious God who hears and answers our prayers. We can be the same as we seek to rebuild, uh, whatever it might be in our lives, or as we seek to rebuild together as the church here at St John's. Let's pray. Who knows how God might answer? We know he's listening. Then we get chapter 3, um, and we get the first of a list of names in Nehemiah. Nehemiah's book has got a lot of lists of names in it. Um, there's chapter 3, there's chapter 7, there's chapter 10, there's chapter 11, there's chapter 12. Um, we didn't miss most of them out, believe it or not, um, in our readings. <laughs> some of them are very long. And some of the names are the ones we expect. They belong to the lead figures. Nehemiah, the governor. Ezra, the scribe. Eliashim, the high priest. But most of the names are the names of ordinary folk. You know, they're, they're Fred and Mary who live at number 26. Names. Why is that? Why did God bother putting all of these Fred and Marys in the list? Well, I think because he wants us to know that he knows us by name. He knows each one of us, and that's why he hears our prayers. We're reminded through these lists that God has his eyes on each of us, on everyone, and he has a purpose and a role for us. If we as people, he's got his eye on us, and he would like you know, he wants to partner with us and things. It wasn't just special people who rebuilt the walls. It was Fred and Mary. It wasn't just special people who moved back in to make Jerusalem a great city again. It was Fred and Mary. So that means that God has kingdom building purposes for all of us. Whoever we might be, young, old, male, female, whatever our race background, whatever our nationality, all of us can start the day with a simple prayer. God, what have you got in store for me today? Please show me what you'd like me to be doing to serve you today. And so these everyday heroes in chapter 3, they get named and they get cracking and building the walls. And likewise for us, um, as we seek to advance God's purposes here, we can expect to find things tough at times. So there were people who did not like what was going on, so we got opposition in chapters 4 and 6 from outside. Um, it might be relatives who say dismissive things like, are you sure you're not taking this God thing just a bit too seriously? Um, or, you've become a real god bother recently, haven't you? Whatever it is, as we take God seriously, so there may well be flat. Um, and if God decides to grow this church in the ways that we'd like him to, then I don't know how this falling gossip network will react. But, like Nehemiah and the wall builders, they weren't distracted by people, they kept their eyes on God and they kept their eyes on the task in hand. It's like what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he'll take care of everything else. But also, just like there can be problems from outside, so if we seek to build God's kingdom, say there can be the risk of tension is within our community. And we mustn't let sin and division hinder what God wants to do to bless us and to bless our parish through us. So if you remember chapter 5, the nobles were exploiting uh, the debts of their fellow Jews and, and the powerful people, instead of serving the weak, were convincing them for what they could get out of them. I guess it's a healthy reminder for those on the PCC, for example, that we're there to serve the purposes of God, to, to make decisions that serve God's purposes, to reach out to those that don't know Christ and for the benefit of the whole body. You know, we're not there to use our power and influence to get things our way. And I don't say that because I think that's a problem. I say that because I think it's the most obvious application that comes out of Nehemiah chapter 5. Probably the second most obvious one is whether we're on PCC or not, when we sin against each other, if we sin against each other, then, like the nobles did then, 
they confessed it, they repented, and the people of God then got on with life. And it's amazing what God can do with people who are committed to living his way in big ways and in small ways. So by the end of chapter 6, in 52 days, they've repaired or rebuilt the whole city wall. All completed, job done. Could I have the next slide, please? And so with the wall rebuilt, the infrastructure in place, we get lessons in the second half about what's it like to be people of God living faithfully. So chapter 8. Um, we're to be a people who are reading and are rooted in the scriptures, who get our energy and our joy and our identity from our relationship with God. There's that very famous verse in there, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that is from Nehemiah. That was how they did it. Um, we'll think about that a lot more as we look through Philippians um, from the next week onwards. And as we come to God and as we encounter Him and His goodness, so we are aware of our sin and our brokenness, and so we need to confess, we need to repent, we need to be people who are always doing that. Not because we want to go on a guilt trip, not because we're trying to earn God's favour, but because confession and repentance is the way to growth, is the way to maturity, is the way to wholeness and holiness and godliness. What then does rebuilding St John's look like in the light of these lessons from there? I don't think we have to become something we're not. I think we carry on being what we are. A bunch of regular people, praying to God, living faithfully. When we get things wrong, we confess and we, we repent. Um, we work to be a community together. Um, and we just say, okay, well, what's the next step? And we put one foot in front of the other. I think that's some of the simple stuff that Nehemiah teaches us, but that it can be so easy to forget. Ultimately, though, we ask the question, not what do I want for my church, but what does Christ want for his church? And as we pray, with his help, it can happen. Last one, please. So will it all be plain sailing? Well, it wasn't the Nehemiah's day, um, but with perseverance and despite setbacks, by the end of the book, or by the end of chapter 12, the city is rebuilt and rededicated to God. And if I was writing the story, I'd stop there. I'd put my pen down and publish my best-selling memoir. If it was Hollywood, we'd roll credits, wouldn't we? Or we'd have that kind of montage of photos of happy people enjoying the war, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but Nehemiah doesn't do that. Instead, we get odd, grumpy, chapter 13. Chapter 13, Nehemiah <coughs> tells us that he's had to go away and he comes back to Jerusalem. And he's find that all the problems and the sins that he dealt with in chapter 10 have come back. So in chapter 10, the people said, we're going to turn away from it. We're going to repent of not caring about the temple. Uh, we're going to repent of breaking the Sabbath. We're going to repent of marrying people from neighbouring countries who will lead us to worship other gods. Um, and... Uh, Nehemiah gets them to that point, and then for 12 years it seems that they, they live faithfully like that. Then he goes away, and then he comes back after some unspecified time, and then we come back to find the temple's in disarray, um, you know, a saving room is being used as some random bloke's storeroom. Uh, the, the priests have abandoned their jobs because the money, the food isn't coming in for them, so the, the temple worship's not even happening properly. Um, people are trading and doing work on the Sabbath, uh, and that the whole interracial, interreligious marriage thing that was going on there um, has started again with you know, the corresponding risk of the people abandoning God. So, what does he do? Nehemiah does what he did the first time. He sees a problem, he fixes it. Um, he goes about putting things right again, but he does do it quite forcefully. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, and even resorts to violence. And then interspersed with these kind of, here's a problem, I fixed it. Then also you get these one line prayers. Remember me for what I've done, God. Remember them for what they did, God. And it's a curious chapter because what Nehemiah is essentially confessing is that whatever he managed to get away with, get achieved with the walls, um, what he did for the people did not last long. It didn't even last his own lifetime. And what did he do with? Um, I contended with them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. And I made them 
take a name with the oath of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons or for your sons. What do we do with that? Well, I think, like the rest of the Bible, Nehemiah is actually very realistic and honest. Um, the Bible doesn't fall into a cast of characters where there are some goodies who are always good and only ever do the right thing, and there are some baddies who are only ever bad and only ever do the wrong thing. Sin lurks in every heart, including Nehemiah's. The only person who doesn't sin in the Bible is Christ. Um, and so, in a sense, Nehemiah is saying, look, I'm still just one of you guys. I'm just another ordinary believer. But also, like the rest of the Bible, Nehemiah is there saying, the thing that drove me was faithfulness to God. So, um, you could read, well, I wanted to make a name for myself, so I rebuilt the city. But he doesn't do that. It's peppered with prayers saying, God remember me, God remember me. Um, and for all the success of the first 12 chapters, Nehemiah concludes chapter 13, highlighting that he failed with the people in some significant ways. Um, I think because he wants us to say, well, even in the failure, what makes us tick? I was faithful to God, what makes us tick? Again, it's another version of Jesus' invitation to see first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and trust him with the results. Now, whether he understood this or not, I think in, in these ways and in other ways, I think the reason why God got Nehemiah to write chapter 30 is to point us to Jesus Christ. Because Nehemiah, blind with much prayer and with God's help, restored the city, but only temporarily. And so to nick a line from the Christmas carol, the hopes and fears of all the years were not met in Nehemiah. They weren't met in his life, and he knew it. He knew, though, that there were these great prophecies of the Messiah, and that one day uh, the world would be restored, and all nations, instead of dragging the people of God away from God, would instead come to God themselves and worship the one true God of the Bible. And I think it's Nehemiah's saying, way of saying, look, the best is still yet to come. You, know, you might read my memoir thinking, I'm this great famous person, I'm not the Messiah. The best is yet to come. And of course it did come in Jesus Christ. Sin and evil undid Nehemiah's good work. But as we all remember at communion, Christ has paid for our sin on that cross when he died for us. And so he knows, he, he can, he's dealt with that. So when he talks about his building project, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There is a building project that Nehemiah was pointing towards but didn't achieve himself, which is Christ's building project of the church. People coming to know Christ for themselves, us being built up in faith and hope and love and maturity. So in our lives, let us follow Nehemiah's example um, and put faithfulness to Christ first. As we do so, May Christ build each one of us up. May God's guidance be our blueprint for our lives and for our church. May His Holy Spirit be in our hearts. Give us the strength and the courage, the faithfulness, the love and the unity that we need. And then, may His good kingdom advance here at St John's and in all of our lives. Amen. Please stand as we sing out. <laughs>
Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. But the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honours me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside of us and that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what are defiles. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We declare our faith in Christ who can cleanse us from all within, uh, and we are indeed hoping for a thousand tongues to come and praise the Lord, a thousand hearts in the name. Uh, we, we, we believe in a great God. Do you believe and trust in God, the Father who made the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, who saved mankind? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit. Loving Lord, thank you for bringing us to this day. Defend us in your mighty power, and grant for this day we will fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, and let our thoughts, words, and deeds be acceptable in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the holiday season. We praise you for the restorative effects of the holiday, or even a pleasant change of scenery can bring. We pray for all who are wanting rest and relaxation. Let them know that through Jesus they can find rest wherever they are or whatever situation they are in. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask, O oh Lord, for comfort and rest for all the people known to us who are ill. We pray especially for congregation members and family and friends. We pray especially for Ruth Wright, Margaret Rose, Phoebe, Carol Hudson, Mark Duckworth, Dorothy Duckworth, Kieran, Stella Davy, Victoria Smith, Nina Hepperthwaite, Jackie King, and Alex Barber. Please strengthen them and heal them, gracious Father. And please console the bereaved, O Lord. Please put your loving hand into the hands of all who are missing your love for. And we pray especially for the family and friends of Mary Berea, Derek Ball, Judy Wing, Bobby James, David Griffin, and Aileen Hannah. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the situation in Afghanistan. Let us not succumb to inertia when thinking about the plight of refugees. Help us to think of them as individuals, people with hopes, fears and cares, and let us remember to think like this when interacting and meeting people closer to us. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all children and the staff of schools as they return for the new term. We pray
pray especially for all families whose children are starting school for the first time. We think of all church schools, in particular our own. We ask, O oh Lord, that all will be happy and safe, especially in the time of the pandemic. Loving Lord, bless and guide Reverend Greg as he and others develop outreach and community activities for the children and for the adults of our parish. We pray that many will come to know you from such events, and we pray that we will all have a greater understanding of you, Heavenly Father. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, please stand as we share the peace with one another. Christ has brought us near to God and then brought us near to one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, also with you. Let us share a socially distanced sign of the peace. And now we remain standing uh, for our third hymn and uh, there is unofficial peace afterwards in the form of tea and coffee after the service, so please do stay for that.
lets us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us. It came to meet us in your son. break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Then we are made, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are we who are called to this hour. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be with you. We will bring a communion to the the top of the nave, please do come forwards. Uh, there will be hands to jail for you to take uh, before you take it, and there's the dispenser on uh, that side, and then Mary can be on the other side. Um, so we'll do that in a cage to clear away. Um, in your heart state, as you come forwards, draw near in faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your heart. By faith, be thanks to God our Creator, feed your children with the true manner of living bread from heaven. Let this holy food sustain us through our earthly pilgrimage until we come to that place where hunger and thirst are no more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray together with the prayer on the screen. Almighty God, God. We thank you for feeding us through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we are giving our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out to the power of the Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We stand for our final day. I praise you.
And may the God who is good to us be with us in our hearts. May we live lives that tell of his praise in word and deed. And may his peace uh, go with us from this place. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Go in that peace to love and serve our Lord. In the name of Christ.